going to talk about an example from the world of manufacturing, uh, creating digital twin models. Um, so this is going to be a brief demo of actually a pretty major project that we've been working on uh, in the last couple of months, analyzing sensor data from manufacturing processes in order to understand and ultimately increase product output, increase product yield. Now, in this case, uh, it's the yield for semiconductor wafers used to make um, chips, integrated circuits. But those same methods that I'm showing you today can actually apply in other settings too. So uh, genomics, for example, genomic sequencing, um, uh, by contrast, digital advertising, where you want to track, um, you know, many different URLs that customers visit in order to draw conclusions about their profile. So anything where you've got sort of an outcome that you're interested in that may be driven by a haystack of, of variables and you kind of want to find the needle in the haystack. Um, so in this case, with the, the digital twin for the manufacturing plant, we create, we're creating um, this twin as a, a virtual representation, well, a model, really, a mathematical model of the manufacturing pro process. And this is enabled really by the convergence of a lot of recent technological advances, uh, IoT, all the sensors that are scattered throughout the fab, uh, machine learning in order to build the predictive models, um, and perhaps above all, big data technology, which is really necessary to handle what comes down to literally millions of variables. So this diagram represents a process flow, sort of proceeding clockwise here. Um, and at each process step, as the wafer goes through the manufacturing process, there's sensor trace data. Um, and these might be, say, pressure or temperature readings or the thickness of an etching, whatever it might be. And there may be literally thousands of these process steps, you know, as these chips get more complex. And within each process step or within each sensor, there may be thousands of time series me me measurements. So thousands of sensors, thousands of time series measurements, each of them interesting, right? Which point of which sensor um, is, is likely to be indicative of, of poor yield or good yield? That's really at the heart of what we're trying to do here. Now, once processing is complete, we've gone through all these processing steps, um, the product is tested uh, and ultimately producing a count of failures, or if you view it the other way, uh, a measure of yield. Uh, so with that, we can create a model of yield loss. Um, and that's a model that's a function of all these process parameters, basically the sensor readings, um, uh, to produce the measure of yield. So think of this as just your standard sort of regression model, right? Where you're trying to measure an outcome variable, in this case yield, and the inputs are these parameter process, are these process parameters that basically the sensor readings from each sensor and each point in time. So that's the digital twin model that I'm going to create. And, and this is not any ordinary model because again, there can be thousands of steps uh, with thousands of sensors, each having these thousands of time series points. So that's millions of individual input variables and then thousands, if not more of observations, meaning you know, the number of wafers going through the factory. So you're aggressing thousands, if not more, of observations against millions of variables. So not a big surprise, big data technology is, is going to be needed. So how do we solve this? Well, we, we do it with two major components of TIBCO's analytics stack. Starting over here on the right, there's sort of the end product, if you like, is TIBCO Spotfire, where we visualize the results of the model. So nice and easy to understand for the fab manager in terms of like yield uh, charts and, and simple heat maps showing the causes and effects, um, all happening within TIBCO Spotfire. And that's backed by large scale processing by the TIBCO data science platform over here on the left. And that's where we do the analytics. First, uh, really in two chunks here, um, our big data capabilities where we're leveraging Spark and uh, in, uh, in cluster processing. Uh, to, do the, to do the data processing, and then Statistica uh, to rapidly build uh, predictive models. Okay, cool. So let's actually see this in action. I'm going to switch over to, again, I'm going to start sort of on the right of that diagram with the, with the final output, right? This is the final result, the dashboard that's created in Spotfire for the factory manager. Um, uh, initially, there's only a low level of yield loss over here on this top chart here where I'm looking at... at uh, uh, the failure percent, if you like. Um, now, the heat map downstairs here shows the results of the digital twin model. Each row here represents one of the sensors. 
uh, and the columns represent a time series of you know, those sensor readings, pressure, temperature, whatever it is. And cells are colored by variable importance. So the heat map is showing which sensors and which points in time we should examine in order to understand what is driving yield loss. That's really the core of this. And right now, as you can see, not much of interest is happening. <laughs> no variables are particularly important uh, because nothing important is happening. So let's go ahead and get the latest data off the factory floor. And you see here some spikes in yield loss. Uh, and in turn, we've rerun the model. So we're rerunning this big data digital twin yield model, and we're populating the heat map with the results. Uh, and if I go back in time now and sort of compare that, you can see here, again, things were normal, and now we're getting some spikes. Um, so if I go ahead and mark some of these bad lots over here, um, and I also pick this top sensor, which is where it seems like the most important um, variables are happening, the most important sensor and, and time points, uh, that allows us to actually drill into the, the, the actual sensor traces. So red here means bad lots and green means good lots. Uh, and we're seeing the good stuff has these elevated, say, pressure readings, um, uh, while the bad material is just kind of flat there. So it's showing us why these have been highlighted. There's a, a, a significant difference between good and bad here. And so that's why sensor four and over this particular time period might be interested in looking uh, into. If we go back to the earlier time period where things were less interesting, you notice those two things don't differ anymore. Uh, so you can see why that's been selected as a, as a sensor of interest, because when yield is bad, interesting things happen. When yield is not bad, interesting things don't happen. So it's a good sensor to look at. So this is, this is really significant, right? Because what this means is that we're able to go directly from looking at product yield loss, just raw sort of aggregate data, to really dig in using the models to figure out which are the most important sensor readings of all of those thousands of sensors and, and millions of, of inputs. And so that's gonna provide an important clue to understanding the cause of the yield loss. So how do we do that? How do we create those measures of importance? Well, that's a hard problem. That's a hard question to answer and I'm not gonna try and do that uh, just in the next uh, seven minutes. Um, but let me see if I can give a sketch of the sort of thing that we're doing. And, and what's remarkable to me here is using the TIBCO data science platform, which is what you're looking at now, our web-based platform for doing um, uh, complex machine learning, um, is we've created a big data workflow that computes variable importance for these millions of variables uh, based on all these observations, thousands of observations. And we're able to do it with a simple visual workflow that leverages the full computing power of a Spark cluster. So I, I think that's pretty cool. Now the workflow is composed basically of three main steps. The first one up here um, is where we take the original time series. Let me open this up to show you the time series. That's the original input. So for each wafer and for each sensor here, we're showing the time series. So here's the time series. You can see it's pretty wide. In fact, uh, you know, almost a thousand columns, so almost a thousand length in time series. Uh, and the first thing we're going to do is to reduce the size and complexity because there's just too many points and we don't need all of the detail of the time series. So we're going to re reduce that complexity using a method called SACS encoding. Uh, and again, I'm not going to go into the details of this, but you can see visually here um, what that does. Here's the input. Here's a single time series just for illustration that I've just picked out of, of all those thousands of sensors. Uh, and after it's gone through SACS encoding, you see, essentially we haven't lost any information, it's still going up, we're still getting the same spikes, but there's just a lot less data. Instead of a thousand sensor readings, we're now just taking about 50. So the output of the SACS encoder, once we've cleansed it up a little bit, is really a list of these variables, each sensor and each time point, um, and the actual value at that point. But instead of a thousand of them, you see that there's actually, just scrolling down, about 50, and then we switch to another sensor with different time points. You'll also notice another thing, the output of the Saxon coding has now kind of pivoted the data set. We're now no longer having like a thousand or 50 points across, we're getting 50 rows down. And the nice thing about that is that it's sort of a way of, of simplifying the data, because imagine trying to do analytics on a table with a thousand or a million variables. Um, we can actually now take the thousand sensors and the 50 points, so that's 50,000 variables now. So a little simpler, thanks to the SACS encoding, but still a lot. We don't want to store that in tabular form. Um, we've got it in the stack form, and we can now pass this to the real variable reduction set, um, which trims down these um, thousands of variables into something much smaller. So um, basically, this wide data variable selector 
computes correlations between the outcome of the manufacturing process, so the failure that we've included here, uh, and these, uh, these thousands of input variables in the form of the time series data. And here's the output of the wide data variable select. It says for each of these variables, remember a variable is a point in time for a given sensor, we've got a correlation. How significant is that just purely in terms of its individual correlation with, uh, with the yield output? Um, and what that allows us to do now, here's where now things become very simple. We can now just look at those correlations, draw a quick histogram. We can look at all the boring ones here in the middle. Those are the ones with correlations centered around zero um, here. Uh, so we can ignore all those, filter those out. And now we just come out with a smaller number of variables. And now we can unstack back, pivot it back. And now we've kind of got our original data set back, but now with far fewer variables, just the important ones. And now we're in happy land for data scientists, right? A manageable data, uh, table of variables, of the most important variables. And now we can use any technique we like. Um, so having computed the correlations and filtered them down, uh, we can feed it into, in this case, we're uh, computing a, a random forest regression. And the nice thing about that is that it can do nonlinear effects, it can do interactions between variables, uh, and we get also measures of variable importance. And in fact, you see here at the top, and then further down, here are the points from sensor four that we were actually seeing in our heat map um, that were now yielding in a visual uh, format back to the fab manager so they can see what they need to go in and investigate. So what I love about this, you've got beautifully simple charts that are exactly what the, the factory floor manager wants to be able to see, but backed by really powerful analytics uh, using uh, Spark and Hadoop um, and sophisticated algorithms uh, that we can feed into our Spotfire dashboard. Just to finish up, I want to mention some performance numbers because in the end, right, you know, you, you want to have, if not a live view, a pretty uh, fresh view of the data because these yield numbers can change sort of uh, pretty quickly and you want to drill into them uh, pretty rapidly. And, and, and even the models need to change fairly rapidly because uh, what, what on one day or in one hour might be the most significant sensor uh, may not be true um, shortly afterwards as conditions within the, uh, the factory change. Um, so we've done some uh, performance benchmarks and you know, it's on yeah, a relatively um, typical data set where you have say maybe a thousand wafers going through and maybe 20,000 sensors, um, which you know, once we've done the SACS encoding, that's essentially a million variables uh, because there's 50 time points per sensor. Uh, we can do this processing in about a minute. Um, if you go to something much more extreme, this is really the challenge that was given to us by one of our customers. You're now talking about many more wafers, hundreds of thousands of wafers, uh, millions of variables, um, you know, terabytes of data. We can still chomp through that pretty rapidly. Within 15 minutes, we're going to be giving, a, giving uh, an updated model back to the, back to the people that matter. Um, so I'd like to thank the, the whole data science team that you see uh, mentioned on the back on the bottom of the slide here. Lots of work gone into this. Uh, in terms of creating simple and intuitive visualizations, uh, but backed by powerful and scalable computations. Everything I just showed you is, uh, is computed in Spark, is fully parallelized every single one of those algorithms from the row filters up to the, uh, the wide data variable selection. Um, and, uh, uh, and this is available within the, the TIBCO data science platform. And as I say, I think it applies to really any situation where you have a lot of different, well, when you're trying to find the needle in the haystack.